Iran, after uh, so many years of uh, isolation and sanctions, um, Iran is back in the headlines, and not anymore because of its nuclear program, uh, but mostly uh, because of its uh, a political opening, uh, its booming society, as well as its new economic opportunities. It's a big country, almost 18 million people, 71% uh, of the population uh, lives uh, in the city. Uh, it's also a very educated population, which makes it different from other countries in the region. 93% uh, of the population is educated. Um, it's a big change uh, if you compare with the past. It's also a very young country, very young society. Um, more than 50% of the population is under 30. And what's very interesting with Iran is that the women are really part of that dynamic. Um, in Iran today, um, in the universities, you have more female students than male students. Uh, women are everywhere. You can find them driving taxis, uh, it's very different from Saudi. Uh, we often compare Iran to Saudi Arabia, but women drive taxis, they run big companies, uh, they are uh, major surgeons, doctors in the hospitals. Women are sitting in the parliament. Uh, what's also interesting is to take a look at the natality rate. Natality rate. Um, it's around 1.8, which is much closer to the Western standards rather than to the Middle East standards. Uh, the Iranian society is not only uh, modern, but it's also very open to, to the world. Another figure is uh, the penetration of internet, which is 57.2%. According to some experts, it makes Iran being the, the number one in the Middle East. But the question is, and I'm going now to reach to my second point, is how did we get uh, how did we get here, despite a very uh, repressive system which, over the top, mixes uh, politics and Islam? It's very important to remember that when the revolution happened in Iran, you had everyone in the streets. You had young people, you had liberal people, leftists, communists. The religious people were just a short, um, a short percentage of these uh, big revolutionary groups. But Iran, that's something that the, the region doesn't have um, anymore these days. It had a, a big charismatic guy, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was back then in exile in France. So he was charismatic, but he was also religious. And um, he developed a, a, a system based on what you know very well here too in Lebanon, Velayat al-Fari, that you pronounce Velayat al-Fari. Yes. So what happened is, uh, at the end of the 70s, you had a lot of restriction coming up. Restriction on women, women were forced to wear a, a hijab, uh, Western music was forbidden, intellectuals, there was a huge uh, crackdown on intellectuals. Um, restrictions were also, um, like men were also facing these restrictions because for instance, I see all of you are wearing ties today, so back then in the 90s you would have all been arrested because the tie was considered as a Western item, so it was totally banned and you could end up in jail just for for, the, for wearing this, uh, th this item. What happened too is uh, very quickly after this revolution, after the religious took over, uh, Iran-Iraq war started. It started in, the, in uh, 1980 and it lasted for eight years. So imagine during these eight years, you had a war with a neighboring country and the system used this war, this uh, neighboring enemy, as an excuse to crack down on the inside enemies uh, which were the intellectuals, the journalists, the, the opponents. To give you an idea on uh, the very complicated Iranian system that was created by them. Because um, it's complex and unique. Because it gives a huge power to the supreme leader. As you can see, he's controlling the armed forces, he's controlling the judiciary system, he's controlling another um, political body which is the Expendency Council. He also has the power <coughs> to choose the head of the national TV. Uh, as we saw recently, he has a key role also, uh, he had a key role on the nuclear uh, negotiation because he is the one controlling uh, the, 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 nuclear, uh, the, the nuclear system. Uh, Besides that, back then Ayatollah Khomeini was, um, let's say, smart enough but also like tricky enough to, um, so to keep power on the armed forces, 
But because he was not really trusting 100% his armed forces, he created a parallel army, which, which are the Pasdaran, the Revolutionary Guards. So you are there with two different armies. So back then his idea was like very basic, uh, like typical, um, let's say, dictatorship idea, uh, thinking that in case of a coup uh, against, uh, against his system, there would be this parallel army who could uh, keep control on the first army. Uh, retrospectively now, when you talk actually to Muslim brothers, most of them are in jail now in Egypt, they are telling you, oh, we wish uh, Morsi, Mohammed Morsi, was as smart as Ayatollah Khomeini because that was the problem of Morsi. Um, so he managed to build out this kind of system which could manage to create also some influence in the region. Um, but the thing is, and that's the complexity of Iran, um, so according to, again, this, uh, this graphic, you have all the ingredients for a dictatorship. So you are thinking, OK, maybe like Iran, you could compare Iran to back then uh, Gaddafi in Libya or Mubarak in Egypt. But the, trick, the, 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 the complexity part is that you have the ingredients of a dictatorship, but also you have a system with a democratic process. Because under, under the supreme leader, you have different political bodies that are directly elected by the people. So you have the president, you have, you have the parliament, and you have the assembly of experts, which is a body of 88 clerics who have the ability to choose the next uh, supreme leader, who is now uh, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who succeeded to uh, Khomeini back in uh, 1989. Uh, uh, um, let's start with the positive uh, surprise. 97, uh, Khatami was elected. So you are in front of a, a, a religious man, but open-minded. Um, he was the first president who uh, traveled to the US. He reduced the censorship on the media, but as well on, on the movies, on the cinema, on the theater. Um, it's someone who um, also, for the first time, uh, challenged the intelligence services. These elections somehow created a surprise, positive surprise, but then, uh, 2005 uh, came and you had another surprise which was more of a negative surprise I would say both for the society and for the outside world because uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad who everybody heard of uh, especially when he came to talk about the nuclear issue uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was elected he was an ultra conservative president he started isolating the country uh, he um, increased the nuclear program which started leading to the first round of sanctions, second round, etc. Then you had 2009, when this time um, the surprise was even worse because, um, and it shows, it shows out there that the supreme leader still has his power over these elections because that time people went to the polling stations, they voted in mass, but the problem happened is that uh, the the votes were not even counted, and uh, the, the second victory, the re-election of Ahmadinejad was announced, which led to huge demonstrations in the streets and a big crackdown, a lot of repression that brought Iran even more isolated inside and from the, from the outside world. Then let's come to 2013. New surprise, people went again in mass to, uh, to the polling stations and they elected a moderate president, Hassan Rouhani. So that election was a key sign of the desire of the society for more changes. Um, it was also a sign that when you allow uh, clear and open elections, people are really eager for change in Iran. And the question that everybody was asking is, how come that time the Supreme Leader allowed such a fair and free election? It's interesting to see that the supreme leader in Iran, uh, as much as he can be uh, very extremist and radical, he knows in some levels how to be a, a, a pragmatist. And that's what happened in 2013. Um, the context was very bad. Uh, economic sanctions um, were really um, harming Iran. Uh, they were really biting the country. Uh, the country was, the economy was collapsing. The economy was doing very bad. 
In the meantime, you had a few years before the beginning of the Arab Spring, one after the other, all the autocrats of this region were being toppled. So basically, the Supreme Leader freaked out and he was, uh, he was scared about what would happen to his country if he would block again the election. After so many years of negotiations, um, a, a nuclear deal was finally signed in July 2015 and the first sanctions were lifted uh, last, uh, last January. Beside that, we had uh, recently the parliament elections with also a new surprise because for the first time the reformists managed to come back inside uh, the parliament. So we have signs of the society now opening more than, uh, than before and a clear example of how this system can easily navigate from democracy to dictatorship, I would say. So where are we standing now? Um, there's definitely uh, a wave of hope. I was, uh, I was back in Iran in, uh, in March and just by looking at people's faces, you could see the smiles back on the faces, a sense of optimism, a sense of hope. Um, besides that, you, you, you could really sense that there was some sort of uh, uh, economic uh, opening. Uh, in my plane, most of the people traveling with me were not Iranians anymore, but uh, first of all, a lot of tourists, a lot of European tourists, very curious about Iran today and uh, a lot of uh, businessmen as well. Air France is a good example, just started uh, relaunching its flights to, to Iran for the first time in, uh, in years, but I think we should remain cautious. So basically you have, for instance, in terms of the economy, you have big, big companies coming back to, to Iran, especially companies who used to be based in Iran, so who use, who are used also to the system and they are very used to navigate inside this kind of system. But regarding um, new companies, as far as I see, uh, they are adopting a much more cautious approach. Uh, why? I think first is because um, Iran is not a very transparency, doesn't have a very transparency system. Another key is, okay, we all talk about the end of the sanctions, but it's not totally the reality, as far as I understand, uh, U.S. is still forbidding its nationals and companies to do direct business with Iran. So when you are a European company or even a Turkish company and you have a partnership with an American company, uh, it's very tricky. You don't want to be sanctioned. You, you're like, you have to uh, estimate the risk of going to Iran or keeping your partners uh, in the U.S. Uh, the new president, uh, so-called reformist Hassan Rouhani, he is going, uh, he's traveling a lot abroad, trying to uh, sell Iran as the new market, as the new place to invest. So this is very positive. But on the other hand, um, during the, the Friday prayer, pr during the Friday prayer, uh, you have a lot of clerics coming up and shouting and saying, well, uh, we, we want to ban foreign brands, uh, uh, we want to kick them out. Like recently, for instance, Versace opened a new store. I mean, its first new store in Iran. The next Friday prayer, one of the Friday prayer leader was like totally trashing Versace. The last and more important um, uh, concern uh, for investors when, when they want to, or businessmen when they want to come and, and, and work in Iran is uh, the power of the Revolutionary Guards. Because they have a political power, they have a military power, but they also have a big economic power. If they want to block a deal, they, they have the capability of doing it. So I would say, I mean, anyone, I'm, sh I'm sure among you, anyone is interested in um, developing projects in Iran, uh, I would say um, it requires a, a lot of time. Uh, it requires to, to, be, to be cautious. And um, if you want to do it right, somehow you, you have either not to upset the around or maybe sometimes you are forced to work with them to a certain, uh, to a certain extent. Thank you. Thank you.